Hello again, it's uh, Steve Smith and it's been a while since I've done one of these screencasts for you. Uh, this is CPD presentation number 28 and the theme is Purposeful Games for Intermediate Level and Above. So this presentation really is about a number of very um, practical ideas for mainly communicative games which you could do with students who've done say at least four years of uh, language work. So there's uh, my credentials at the bottom there, my Twitter handle, my blog, frenchteachernet.blogspot.com, and my uh, research link site called informedlanguageteacher.com. So let's put this in context to begin with. Um, you know, there is a discussion you know, sometimes amongst language teachers about to what extent we should be gamifying lessons. Um, does it somehow devalue our subject uh, to to do games in, in the lesson? I don't think that's the case at all. I think if you see games as just another activity with a purpose, but where there's an added level of motivation and a particular outcome to achieve, perhaps with a competitive element, then it's easy to make a case for uh, games. Um, within the communicative sort of way of looking at things and task-based language teaching, a game is often a task to be achieved where the focus is on the meaning of the language, um, using the language, rather than on the form of the language. So in this sense, it's more motivational to most learners. Um, I think it helps if there's a good pedagogical reason, a language point or particular communicative function you want to work on. Uh, so it's quite easy to integrate games within your general curriculum plan. So let's start off with uh, a classic game, which is called Alibi, and which I've described uh, before in blogs and in books. This comes originally from EFL. I'm going to describe the basic game to you, but then show you another way that you might use it in a more structured way. So to start with, you tell the class in a very deadpan fashion that a crime was committed last night at 8 o'clock. Let's say um, an elderly lady was attacked in the street. You can sort of prepare the ground by saying that um, it's thought that the two suspects were young people. Um, it's even thought that they come from this school. And it's even thought that these two suspects come from this classroom. By which point some uh, students will be cottoning on that you're having a joke with them. Uh, but you certainly grab your attention by that point. By the way, I would do that um, most likely in English. So then you ask for two volunteers who are going to be your suspects, and they're going to leave the room and prepare their alibi. It's got to be something that they've done together, so that when they come in one by one, they can talk about what they did and what their um, fellow suspect did. And the two stories have to be in line. Now, while they're out of the room, which might take five or ten minutes, um, you prepare questions with the rest of the class, so that when each suspect comes in, um, the class is ready to interrogate them. And you can leave those questions up on the board. So you might go through things like, you know, what was the weather like last night? What clothes were you wearing? Where did you go? What were you doing at 8 o'clock? Um, what transport did you use? What did you eat? Etc, etc. You, you can take this quite a long way. Now, when each person comes in, the first person comes in, you can get them to swear an oath on the dictionary. Um, and then you begin asking questions. So the class will ask questions using the ideas displayed on the board, which the suspect doesn't actually see because they're facing the class. And you as the teacher can help the process along. So if the class aren't producing many questions, you can ask the questions and guide things. After the first person has answered for about 10 minutes, then they leave the room or sit quietly at the back. And the second person comes in and they are asked the same questions. You might have a scribe in the class who takes notes and the idea is that at the end of about half an hour, the class votes to decide if the two suspects are guilty or innocent. Now, there is a, a language sort of point to this. It clearly involves a lot of use of past tenses, mainly the perfect tense or preterite tense. I did, I went, I ate, etc. But also some use of the imperfect tense. Now, what was the weather like? It was raining, I was wearing, that kind of thing. But to be honest with you, in my experience, um, because the students are really into the meanings here, I would let mistakes go. And, and, and if they're just using the perfect tense all the time, then 
absolutely fine. Maybe some light correction here and there for classes that are really clued into accuracy. But this is really, above all, about communication. And it satisfied, satisfies the main goals, doesn't it, of language learning, which are providing comprehensible input and a chance to interact with it, preferably in a motivational, interesting way. Um, here's the more structured version that you could use with classes perhaps who are not so creative uh, with language or don't have that bulk of knowledge that enables them to communicate. In this case, you could simply give your two suspects a set of target language points. So you're going to tell them what they did and uh, each person will have their own set um, and, and they have to be sort of have points in common as it were. Similarly, with the rest of the class, while they're outside preparing, the rest of the class um, will be given a set of ready-made questions which can be displayed. And you can practice those by reading them out loud, um, translating them, um, possibly getting the class to think of follow-up questions in, in response to imagined answers and so on. So that al allows you to do the activity with classes perhaps you might not be so strong. So that's the game Alibi. Here's another one, uh, which is quite a fun parlor game, which you could uh, use. Um, what can I take on holiday? You could use different contexts for this, but I'll, I'll give you this particular example. So you tell students to start with that they're going to go on holiday and they're going to take certain items with them. So you could say, for example, uh, I'm going to go on holiday and I'm going to take a swimsuit. And then you say, uh, I'm going to go on holiday and I'm not going to take a camera. Now, what you're going to do here is that in the first case, you insert a subtle hesitation. So you would say, I'm going to take a um, swimsuit. And in the second case, I'm not going to take a camera. Give them some more examples and put some subtle hesitations in that the class won't obviously pick up. Then ask students to suggest what they will take. If they insert hesitation, accept their suggestion. Say to them, yes, you can take that. If they answer without a hesitation, tell them they can't take it. No, no, you can't take that. Now, the students will be very curious to know why it is that they can take some items and why it is they, they can't take others. So keep going on with this. And then, because this is quite a subtle one to work out for the class, you can then gradually make it a bit more obvious. So you might say, for example, uh, I'm going to take a um, paddleboard. And then you might say, I'm not going to take a surfboard with no hesitation. So you keep going in this way. And the language used here would probably be topic vocabulary, principally in this case holiday vocabulary, but you can fit it to work with other contexts. It's a fun game and it has lots of comprehensive input going on and lots of chance to um, retrieve stuff from long-term memory. This next one was one I used to use uh, way back, actually. I think I learnt it whilst I was uh, doing some EFL work. And this is, I call it silly story writing. But to start with, you simply brainstorm words from various vocab categories. So I'm going to suggest to you, for example, cities, clothing, pastimes, food and drink, character adjectives, animals, buildings, famous people. So you ask the class, give me as many pastimes as you can think of. Accept all the answers, write them up on the board. Do the same for clothing, do the same for food and drink. Write them up on the board and so on. Then once you've gone through that process, which could take five or ten minutes, lots of vocab retrieval there, then you choose, um, or ask them to choose, one word from each of the eight categories and put them in a list. So you then have a list of eight words on the board. Then tell the class that they're going to co-create a story with you consisting of eight sentences. Each sentence contains one of the words from the list of eight. So you choose the words for them. So, for example, you might say, OK, the first word is Paris. That's a city. And they'll come up with a sentence that might have the word Paris in. And listen to all the suggestions they come up with, discuss them with the class in the target language, see if they can add detail to the sentence to make it interesting, to make it fun and then write up the agreed sentence on the board. Then repeat that process 
for each of the other eight words until you end up with an account which might have absurdities in it, it might be silly. It does have to follow on as a story, but usually you end up with some kind of silly story. And in the process, you have um, produced lots of lots of input and interaction. Language used here, well, again, topic vocabulary quite clearly, and most likely past tenses if you're going to tell your story in the past. This simple game called Me Too, let me just describe this one to you. So this is a partner game, and it's simply about students having to find things that they have in common with their partner. So they have to ask questions. Um, so their partner might agree with them and say things like, oh yeah, me too, or me neither. And if they do, they score a point. So for example, oh, I like to play football. Me too. That gets a point. Um, I like going to the cinema. Me too. That gets a point. Um, I play golf. Okay, so maybe the answer won't be me too. If the partner doesn't agree, then they have to reply with some sort of uh, pre-prepared phrase that you've worked on. Like, oh, really? Um, I don't play golf. I prefer football. And in that case, no point is, is scored. Um, for this one, you would probably supply all the questions for some classes. You'd simply give them a list of, say, 20 questions that they have to ask their partner. And each partner would have a different set of questions. With a really good class, you could just let them loose on it and say, OK, it's up to you to come up with the questions and see if your partner agrees or doesn't agree. But quite a low preparation sort of lesson, that one. And uh, it would produce lots of question forms quite clearly. This next one's different to the other activities I'm suggesting to you here because it isn't really about communication. It's about grammatical accuracy and using grammatical metalanguage, talking about grammar. And essentially, it's an error correction game or an error spotting game with the focus on accuracy. So there are various ways of doing grammar auctions. But in this particular version, you could split the class into two halves and give each half a million euros to spend. You then display sentences in order. So you put a sentence up and students from each team put their hands up and bid a sum to say if the sentence is right or wrong. So some of the sentences you display will be absolutely correct. Others will have errors in. Now, depending on the class, you can make these errors as subtle and as detailed as you like, or perhaps pretty obvious. So you display your sentences one at a time. Some have these minor errors of morphology, verb endings, or syntax could be word order, for example, if you're working in German. And individuals from each team then place a bet. If they're right, they double their money. So they might sort of decide, I'm going to bid 10,000 euros. If they're right, they double their money. If they're wrong, they lose their money. And after about 50 minutes, you see which team is left with most money. Um, language used here, well, there is some input language in the sentences that you display. But often, we're going to be talking in English here about grammar. So it's a chance to focus on the form of the language, review little bits of grammar, and, uh, you know, you can target the sentences to match with particular work that you've been doing recently. So that's called a grammar auction. Uh, this next one's called Would I Lie? And in this case, um, you display six sentences about yourself on the board, three of which are true, sorry for the typo there, and the other three are plausible but untrue. For example, you could say, my brother has twin sons, I have two cats called Freddy and Cosmo, and so on. So you put up six sentences, all of which are plausible, but only three of which are true. Then the students have to ask you questions. They have to listen to your answers, weigh up your responses, and then decide from what you've been saying um, which of the three statements are true. And you can give them as many clues as they might need. Again, it much depends on the class. You can tailor make your answers to fit with the class in front of you. You could even make this competitive if you wanted to get students to play the game in pairs or in small groups, for example. Um, or just do it as a whole class activity. Um, no particular language focused on here, although they would more likely be using a lot of second person verbs because they're asking you. So this is a rare opportunity for them to, in French, for example, use the vous form or equivalent in whatever language you are teaching. Quite a low preparation game, I think you'd agree. 
This next game is all about numbers and it's based on the TV programme Countdown which is well known to viewers in the UK. Um, this is more of an intermediate level game rather than an advanced level game. And to start with, prepare the class by revising numbers. Make sure they do know their numbers up to 100. And then teach them how to say plus, minus, multiplied by, divided by and equals. So they've got the language to use when they describe a sum. Students work individually in this activity. So, as per the game on TV, you're going to ask the class to suggest numbers to you. They can be either single digits, 1 to 9, or the numbers 10, 25, 50, 75, or 100. So they come up with numbers, and you write up six of them. You can actually prompt them and say, give me a larger number, give me a small number. You write up six numbers. And then you give them a three-figure number at random. Let's say it's 365. And students have to try and arrive at the figure 365 using some or all of their six numbers. And you can give them a suitable time limit. It might be that after two minutes nobody manages to work out you know, an exact answer 365, but you would give points to the person who got closest. If they claim they, they got close to it or got the actual number, 365, they then have to describe the arithmetic they used in the process. And as they're describing, with your help, write it up on the board. Great way of revising numbers, um, quite a motivational task. Students like this. You could allow them to use their calculators, probably would do in most cases, um, or some classes you might prefer to make it a pen and paper activity. So that's a handful of uh, effective games, I think, which work for students. And they were taken from either the book on the left, The Language Teacher Toolkit, um, the book I wrote with Gianfranco Conti, or my own book there called Becoming an Outstanding Languages Teacher. And I thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope to do another CPD broadcast soon. Bye.